Uh, I'm Mark Chambers. I'm an Associate Director of the IBE. So welcome to uh, one of our public events. Um, the, if you're new to the IBE, the IBE is a charity that uh, exists to promote the highest standards of ethical behavior in business. Uh, we do this uh, through a range of channels, through our publications and thought leadership, uh, our, our training and advisory work, uh, our network of practitioner meetings and public events like this. Um, today is a little bit of an experiment in that it's the first webinar that I think we have, first event that we have run in August. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm hoping we get a reasonable number of people joining us, but I'll, it would, we understand, of course, that there'll be a lot of people who are away at this time. Um, so please let your colleagues know that um, a recording of this webinar will be available on demand uh, in a, a couple of days time through our website and our YouTube channel. Um, today's discussion is about some of the opportunities, but also some of the practical challenges and ethical risks around the increased use of AI in recruitment. Um, we, we've seen a, a few examples of where flawed use of technology has amplified biases and led to poor outcomes for non-typical candidates going through the recruitment process. Uh, and we're going to discuss some of you know how to leverage the opportunities and how to be how to navigate your way past some of the challenges later on with our uh, with with our panel. I'll introduce our fabulous panelists shortly, but I thought I would share a few slides to help perhaps help frame the the discussion. So Alex, if we could share the slides, that would be great. There we go. Thank you very much. And the slides um, we'll, we'll 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 put the slides on um, on, on the website at this at the same time as that we make the on-demand version of this available. So you can see these, you can see these later. Um, so why do fairness issues in recruitment matter so much? So let's have the next slide, please, Alex. Um, you know, it's an ethical fundamental foundation in most workplaces that, you know, you want all of your colleagues to have an equal opportunity to be their best. Um, and, and businesses, kind of get this and, and businesses have understood for some time at least the best businesses have understood for some time um, both the business and societal benefits of bringing in different life experiences and different ways of thinking to your teams you know genuinely diverse teams perform better uh, and that they're also more successful in their interactions with customers and communities because they better represent the groups that they that they serve and most businesses have you know already done a, a pretty excellent job on inclusion in the workplace and ensuring that core processes talent development um, uh, all the performance management um, uh, processes you know based on a foundation of, of, of fairness and on objectivity and that's and that's great but you can only be included in that process if you've made it through the door. And many of the biggest barriers um, to getting into an organization are often, uh, are often on entry. Um, so if we can have the next slide. And, you know, recruitment is challenging. Um, it's, it's, it, it's, it, it's hard yards um, doing this. We all know how much time it takes. It's a huge drain on management resources. Um, and the, you know, the process quite often defaults to, if you're doing that early sift of candidates, it quite often defaults to relatively easily measured criteria. If you're recruiting at a really senior level, a board position, um, you tend to see uh, long lists with people with quite conventional career paths. If you're doing entry level, um, you, you might be focusing on exam grades, um, and, and other uh, apparently object, uh, um, 
objective criteria, and I'm sure Raf will have something to say on that later on. Um, but these are these are data points that are not always comparable, um, and a lot of the judgments that are made um, during recruitment are inevitably subjective. You're making a judgment on the likely fit. You're making a judgment on expectations of performance and, and potential in a candidate that you have a limited uh, view on. And the process, therefore, is you know, highly susceptible to bias on behalf on the part of the interviewer. Um, and of course, you know, for many managers, I'm afraid, it's much safer to hire someone um, who has the same life experience as you, who's going to offer um, uh, support and limited challenge to your thinking. Um, and that's not necessarily the right thing for the business. In fact, it's usually not the right thing for an effective team. You really want to hire people who are going to who are going to think differently to you and challenge your thinking. And there's limited support quite often for hiring managers in doing this. You know, hiring managers are not sophisticated assessors of people and are often given limited training and support for how they should conduct even a, you know, even a conventional um, competency-based one-hour one -hour interview. And of course, there are huge pressures to get through it quickly. Um, so the reality is, you know, it's, it's impossible to fairly and fully and objectively assess every potential candidate. Um, and it's so easy to pass over that diamond in the rough that doesn't quite meet the criteria that, that you're wanting to look for. Um, the sad truth is that the people you probably really want on your team never get the opportunity to work for you. So is, a, is AI the answer? Well, AI certainly offers the you know the the, the prospect of uh, uh, and the, the prospect of of automation um, that uh, easy sift through or apparently easy sift through the high volume early stages of assessment you know you're hiring a, 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 an accountant um, you don't want to waste any time um, reviewing somebody who does not have the right professional qualifications for the job that you're looking for. Um, the significant internal resource savings, these are labor intensive processes if you're doing them manually. Um, it potentially gives you the opportunity of looking at a much larger pool of potential talent. Uh, talent. Um, you've got to have stricter criteria for a basis, uh, as, as a basis for, the, for review, but that in theory sounds like a good thing. Uh, it ought to lead to more con uh, consistent decision making. And the whole um, process, if it's done well, also improves the candidate experience. You get much quicker decision making. Um, scheduling is no longer a problem. Uh, it's it's it, it 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 has all the promises of of a fairer and more objective process. But um, there are some risks. And if we have the next slide. Alex, um, you know, fundamentally, if you've got a flawed recruitment process that's chock full of, of inherent biases, automating is not is is not likely to fix it for you. Um, there and and there is a risk of turning a range of individual biases across your hiring managers into institutional ones for at an organisational level. Um, it could certainly make things worse if, uh, you know, there is no moral um, bias or moral foundation in the machines that learn. Um, if the test data sets are narrow and not representative, um, uh, that the, the machines will not help you identify that and flag that for you. Um, and the whole process, if you're not careful, can give a false assurance of, of, of fairness. Um, you know, we've seen well-meaning organizations that have had a go at this, but placed too much faith in the, 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 the process. Um, you know, Amazon perhaps most notably, um, you know, with their recruiting engine that, um, 
uh, taught itself that you know male essentially that male candidates were 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 preferable. Um, you know, had I think credit to them in that they at least acknowledged that and withdrew it. Um, but you know, there's a, there's a, a real danger here that rather than increasing diversity, um, the, the the machines end up selecting uh, in the image of the teams that they are that you're trying to fix. So if you have an unrepresentative data set, you may well get a, an unrepresentative um, uh, recruitment uh, engine. Um, and, and why should you know people care about this beyond the ethical um, dimensions? Well, um, regulators are, are waking up to this in a big way. It's interesting that the, the Information uh, Commissioner's Office, which of course has um, significant fining powers, it is going to you know, part of its plan for the next twelve months is to is looking at uh, how. Uh, AI in recruitment um, can have a negative impact from those from diverse backgrounds. Uh, it will potentially be helpful if what emerges from that is some is some guidance for developers on how to ensure that their use of their use of data is is fair. But um, th those who don't do this uh, don't do this well. I think the stakes are being raised. Um, so, you know, how can we um, take advantage of all the upsides of this of this technology, but ensure that you know we don't end up wrongly disqualifying a great candidate, which is all, which is of course the outcome that that, that we're worried about here. So let me introduce today's panelists. Um, I, I'm in, enormously grateful uh, that. Uh, they're able to join us today. We have uh, Tanej Kapilashrami, who's Group Head of Human Resources at Standard uh, Chartered Bank, and uh, Tanej is, is in India. So thank you for interrupting what I'm sure is a 24-hour day for you there uh, to, to, to join us today. And we have um, Rafael Makadis, who is um, an entrepreneur and founder and managing director of Rare, which is a highly innovative leading firm in diversity graduate recruitment. So welcome to both our panelists. And if you could come off mute now, and um, I'm gonna ask each of you to make a few opening remarks before we get to questions. Um, but as we go through, you know, as you, um, if you'd like to submit your questions in the audience, if you'd like to submit your questions through the Q&A box, we'll pick those up later on. Um, if you have any technical questions, uh, please put those through the uh, through the, the, the chat box and Alex will try and deal with them, but questions through the Q&A box. But um, first of all, Tanner, perhaps you could open with a, with, with a few remarks on a uh, few thoughts on this area before we, we move to questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark. And I'm actually uh, really looking forward to the uh, expert opinion that I know Ralph will bring to this topic. Um, so it's a really, really exciting to be part of this conversation. I will just say a few things up front because it's such a broad topic, actually, that you could go in any direction. And um, I'll uh, share sort of some of my observations and obviously our experience uh, in Standard Chartered. And then as we get into Q&A, we can decide what's of most interest and, and value to, uh, to the audience. The first thing I will say is, it's really interesting for me that one of the increased, uh, one of the drivers for the increased use of AI in recruitment has been the desire to reduce bias and discrimination. Yet, there are real concerns uh, around flawed use of AI and what it can do uh, to, to actively get people from diverse backgrounds uh, screened out of the selection process up front. So it's a real sort of dilemma. And somebody who is um, uh, an, a massive favor of, uh, in favor of the power of technology and AI-backed uh, back technology in driving progressive people and cultural agenda, it's this dichotomy that is hugely fascinating and one I, I'm pretty sure we are going to uh, explore a bit more in detail. I mean, my view is, 
that we need to be solving the right problem with the right tool, not slapping uh -huh. AI or technology uh -huh. blindly. And, and I think, you know, we go through sort of certain fads in our world. And, and sometimes I feel if the right uh, amount of investment is not done upfront in articulating what is the problem that we are trying to solve. Uh, there is uh, almost certainly, in my experience, the danger that we choose wrong technology and wrong AI. So slapping AI blindly is definitely not uh, the, the right outcome. The third thing I will say is once you are very clear on what is the business problem you're trying to solve, uh, defining the outcomes using the right partners and right technology needs to be an inclusive process as well. And, you know, one of the biggest learnings for me has been in, in some of the tech solutions that we have implemented, many of which are AI back, is that the diversity of the teams that's designing the solutions is incredibly important. And the more thoughtful we have been about the teams that help in choosing the technology, you know, uh, defining the problem statements, you know, looking at the, how do we measure success, uh, the, the better outcomes we have, we've had. So, so I think being inclusive in design and being human-centered in design for me has been um, a, a big learning uh, as, as well. The last thing from our overall principle perspective is to remember that we are not trying to fully replace human capabilities using technologies. And I, I keep saying this point, that we are using, we are creating technology to enhance human aptitude and efficiency. And the, the fact I always say to my, my team is, as machines get better at being machines, humans can get better at being humans. And this idea of the fact that I am going to outsource full decision making to technology or AI is something I do not buy. It, it augments human aptitude and human efficiency. It doesn't replace it uh, completely. So, so that's the again, an overarching sort of principle. Two practical examples I, I will get. I mean, for us, we have applied technology broadly and within that AI across our, our recruitment processes. And it has been hugely beneficial in augmenting our overall talent agenda. So, you know, we've done, we've made very purposeful, thoughtful choices uh, and they have been beneficial. This was the two things. One is, you know, we currently use an AI-based assessment uh, tool. Um, uh, you know, Pymetrics is the one we use for, for those of you who are interested as part of our early careers assessment process. And in selecting that tool, we've done a couple of things to minimize bi bias. The first thing we've done is we've leveraged our vendors debiasing process quite effectively. And what they do is they have an audit AI process, which measures and mitigates the effect of any concerning patterns in training data. So, you know, there is technology that's available and, you know, uh, Ralph will talk about it uh, in, in further detail, I'm sure. But you know, leveraging some of that technology to ensure that we have an appropriate debiasing process for me has been uh, quite effective. And then what we have done is put in a huge amount of work into retrospective studies and diversity checks. And you know, it, you know as the data, as the as throws data, we do a huge amount of due diligence and. You know, sometimes I feel the amount of investment we put in in plugging the technology, we don't, don't support it with the same amount of investment in doing retrospective studies, diversity checks, uh, you know, ensuring that the AI is throwing the right level of outcomes. And, and what we've done is we've been very conscious in some of those investments that we have um, uh, made as well. So, so that's sort of one area. The, the second area, which Mark, you and I have spoken about, is we've got a, a value-based assessment tool which uh, leverages AI and it's a scenario based tool which does the first level of screening for all of our hiring. And again, that's been fascinating because you know what we've done is we've developed sort of scenarios where, where people apply judgment. So it's a situational judgment tool. And based on the, 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 the judgments they apply, you know, we, we, we form a, a broad assessment about their alignment to our culture as, as articulated by our valued behaviors assessment tool. And what we have found is after two, two or three years of just the first six months we ran this, we didn't use it as a screening tool. So we, we did a controlled experiment of, of people who went through it. We recruited everyone, but then we developed a cohort of people who would not have passed this test. So the six months was, and then over the next two years, we were able to measure that cohort against the people who would have scored, uh, who scored uh, at a different, you know, at, at an acceptable level of this and the test. And what it showed us was 
the performance of the individuals who did well on our valued behaviors assessment, and this is again an AI back tool, valued behavior, the, the first year performance was 20 to 25% higher than people who were not successful in the test. Their engagement levels were higher and their new joiner attrition was, was lower. And again, a lot of this retrospective testing helped us develop the, 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 the real business case about why does this matter? And again, you know, helped us sort of check anomalies in the data uh, uh, and in the outcomes, which we were able to feed in, into the loop as well. So those are sort of some of the ways and the way that, that we are thinking about this challenge. I'm gonna stop there, thank you. That, that's really helpful. And I there's, there's a lot that I think we'll want to follow, follow up on that, but uh, Raf, why don't, why don't you kick us off as well and then we'll, and then we'll loop back. Sure, thank you. Um, and, and, and thanks for inviting me. Um, very briefly to explain what we do. Um, my business is 17 years old uh, and there are two parts to it. There's a software part and there's a part where we, well, really there are two software parts to it. There's a, there's a part where we sell software to clients and there's a part where we recruit, manage, develop and place candidates, usually black candidates from lower socioeconomic backgrounds uh, in client firms. Um, but of course that rests on software too. And in fact, we've got a longitudinal data set of 17 years of people who we met when they were first, second years at university, and we sort of we sort of know their outcomes, right? Uh, and we don't use AI in any of our products. We use automation. We have tons of data. Uh, and if I was trying to gussy up the business to get private equity investment or sell it, I sure as hell would say it was AI. In fact, we bought the domain name rare.ai when the Caribbean island of Anguilla made its domain names available for precisely that purpose, but we haven't actually chosen to do that. And the reason is that I think it's almost impossible um, for a vendor or a supplier to get the longitudinal data sets that you need to be properly confident that what you are selling is anything other than snake oil. Um, I completely agree with actually every word of what Tanu said, and I'm very impressed by some of the work that they've done. And of course, this should never serve to replace uh, human decision-making, it, it should serve to augment it. But the holy grail looks like something like this. The holy grail in early careers recruitment in elite professions, which is what we do for Clifford Chance and Linklaters and Freshfields and Slaughter and May and McKinsey and Bain and BCG and JB Morgan and Morgan Stanley and University of Oxford and University of Cambridge, these kind of blue chip organizations is, Okay, this kid is applying to you for a first year program. They're 19 years old. And we can say that there is an 80% probability that if you hire them in 15 years, they'll be a partner or an MD or a VP or whatever it might be. And the reason we can say that is this combination of X, Y, and Z based on 20 years of historic data with sufficient sample size and sufficient statistical probability leads us to conclude uh, with this degree of confidence that we you know that this person is likely to develop in this way that's really hard that's really hard it's hard for the following reasons one no one wants to give you their data because of information security concerns they might do it in-house, they're very reluctant to share the data. Two, most organizations don't have 20 years of consistent data. And three, even those organizations that do have that year of consistent data, if you take a law firm, the single, a bit like what you were saying with Amazon, Slaughter and May or Clifford Chance or Linklaters, all of them, I mean, this is not about any individual firm, they've all been majority female trainees for a very long time and they all have majority male partnerships. Mathematically, the single likeliest data point I can find that tells me a trainee is more likely to become a partner is that they should be male, right? Which is obviously a really unacceptable thing to be prioritizing. And so you have to do all of this deep biasing that, that Tanush talked about. And so then what you end up with is something quite thin uh, if you can do it at all. And of course, the problem with an analysis of a truly longitudinal data set based on long-term progression is that, although, Mark, you're right, organizations have done a lot to improve their cultures. I think if you talk to 
most female partners in law firms or most black MDs in banks, you will still hear that the culture is far from being completely equitable or equitable for everybody. And therefore, people who are different are more likely, even if they are high performers, to have had enough and to walk. But the algorithm doesn't see that. And so it's really tricky. And I'll tell you, yeah, I'm about halfway I'll tell you what I think you can do and what definitely works. AI on who's going to get hired in a uh, volume process is much, much easier, right? Because you don't need as much. You don't need as many years of data. It's just technically easier to do the extraction. And um, some of the things that Tanush talked about, aptitude tests, for example, for lawyers, the Watson Glazer test, that's quite a good, you know, some of these strengths-based models that, that people like CAP do, some of the situational judgment test models that people like Amberjack and Pymetrics do and so on, you can certainly track, okay, who's going to be good in their first few years in the way that Tanish is talking about. And you can have a little loop that maybe if someone is really horrible at a particular test and you've got really strong data to show that people who are horrible at tests go on to be horrible at being a trainee, that can be a, a hard no from the computer. I would suggest probably with an override if you've met the candidate and all of that sort of thing. A couple of other data points that we know work. Not surprising, right? Because we've got 17 years of data on this. If you get grades alone, for the most part, are not great predictors. School grades, I mean. If you're getting A stars at A level from a school where everyone else is getting Ds and Es, there is some data from a study that was done on one of the Magic Circle law firms. There is some data to suggest that that person is likely to outperform in the workplace. Um, and so the software we produce draws attention to these candidates, doesn't automatically bring them through to interview or anything like that, but certainly puts them at the top of the list, stars them and tells the recruiter, you know, that this that these people are likely based on data to be high performers. Um, there is some suggestive stuff that in vocational qualifications. So, for example, if you're a commercial law firm and you've got someone with an 80 in contract law, it's probably worth interviewing them. But of course, to what extent would a good recruiter not just know that anyway? They probably would. And so what you're in there is the realm of automation or intelligence rather than any sort of artificial intelligence. Where it becomes really, really, and I've got a good friend who's, um, she leads on EDI, actually, the Alan Turing Institute, which is the sort of data science institute in the UK. She's an assistant professor there. And she told me that machine learning is a third, a third, a third. It's a third getting your data. It's a third cleaning your data. And it's only a third the calculations. And when you have clean data, for the more years, the better, that's when you can start to find really interesting stuff. Like if you got an A star in Spanish GCSE, and you passed your driving test first time, and you've got retail work experience, you're likely to be an exceptional management consultant because that sort of thing is the sort of stuff that a good recruiter won't know, that automation won't deliver. That's insight. Now, where we see that kind of insight in a big way is on healthcare, right? Because healthcare, you're talking about millions and millions of people. And with the NHS, you've got one, I mean, the data is is not always kept in the best way and they have problems with the systems, but it is one data set. And so like the recovery trial on um, on COVID patients, that showed the power of a big data set and just throwing things at it. Now, you can't do that with AI because it's real people and you're really, you know, you're injecting them with stuff or you're, or you're putting them on nebulizers or whatever. But that showed that this old steroid actually massively reduces your chances of dying from COVID. That's the holy grail in recruitment, right? It's getting a massive data set and loads of data, including stuff we don't even collect, like, for example, driving tests or whatever, and finding patterns that a really conscientious recruiter or a psychologist wouldn't even have suspected. And we're a long way from that, but that is a promise of machine learning. And that's the thing that I think would be revolutionary rather than evolutionary or um, kind of augmenting in the way that everything I have ever seen uh, is. Um, and I, I, my experience, which is you know very limited, and, and I only really know about the UK, and I only really know about early careers and elite professions. My experience is what Tanush is doing is about as far as you can take it at the moment. But I think there's a lot more that could be done in theory 
if we had bigger and cleaner data sets. That's, that's really helpful. Thank, thank you, Raf. And, 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 and Tanish, where, where would you like to take it next? What, what are some of the areas that you've kind of experimented with, but actually, you know, we're, we're not there yet? I mean, again, it's just so many interesting insights uh, from Ralph, and I think it comes back to Mark where you, and you know, I know there are loads of questions coming up, so we can take them. And, I, and you took it there as well. I mean, I think to me the issue is uh, if you outsource uh, recruitment to technology without doing some of the process improvement work, and I know you alluded to that when you did your first couple of slides. So, you know basic things, but I would argue a lot of that is not happening, right? I mean, you know, are your interview panels diverse? Are you in certain situations using uh, blind interviewing for uh, some situations, especially when you are, uh, you know, thinking about social mobility uh, carefully? So are you doing, uh, you know, so for our apprenticeship programs, for example, we do, do uh, uh, blind interviewing for, for, for candidates. What is the level of investment that you are doing around unconscious bias training for hiring managers? Because, you know, let, let, let's be honest, across our business, we've got 14,000 hiring managers, right? I can't expect those decisions. So what's the level of investment that's been done on unconscious bias training around uh, hiring managers? And then where you are leveraging um, technology and within that AI for pieces of the process, what's the validation that's been built in? And, you know, what's the maturity of the system to be able to validate the data to ensure that the test is performing uh, uh, appropriately. And as I said, the simple thing is we apply the industry standard, which is the four fifth rule to ensure that minority groups are not being disadvantaged. It's a small example, but so it's, to me, uh, you know, it's about looking at the end to end of the value chain. And then it's the sort of higher order stuff around what are the tools that you use and uh, you know, are there impacts? You know, when you start thinking about neurodiversity, for example, or you are looking at, you know, people with disabilities, uh, are your tools actively deselecting uh, uh, some of those target audience? And you know, then those are very intentional sort of choices uh, as well that you need to make. And you know, we have found. I mean, my own experience of of doing this for years, uh, I feel that I'm learning every day. I say, you know, you know, it started with a lot of, you know, aptitude type of testing we used to do years ago. So numerical, verbal. Um, we are now doing loads more brain training games. We are doing a lot more how you respond to various situations and various judgments. Uh, so, so again, you need to be very careful around what is the problem you are trying to solve. And while we are doing name blind or blind CVs for apprenticeships, I absolutely agree with Ralph. In many of our markets, we do look at sort of performance and uh, uh, academic performance and you know, what degrees. And again, it comes back to what is the problem we are trying to solve for our exactly. apprenticeship program. And, and it is a very... Uh, diverse it's a very broad topic and I, I and there is no silver bullet so me uh, you know the test technology it gives you one data point you then need educated hiring managers and educated recruiters to be able to leverage these various data points to make the right decision fully understanding that that recruitment again as you said mark in your opening is tough and as I keep saying, recruitment is about managing risk and maximizing the probability of success. That is what you're doing, right? I would love to meet a person who says there is a, a formula or a piece of technology which gets you 100%. No, what you're doing, you're minimizing risk, all the risks that we've spoken about, and it's maximizing the probability of success. And and that's the way, uh, you know, that's the way I see the challenge. But, but you know, it's, it's very interesting because what you're essentially saying is recruitment is about minimize downside, maximize upside, right? But some people say recruitment is about bums on seats, speed, low cost. And I think there's a big difference between businesses that have a bit of margin, like banks and law firms, let's be honest, and businesses that are struggling to survive, like retailers. And you might say, well, look, the, the margin businesses are also intellectual ability businesses and the um, 
the kind of low margin businesses are sort of, you know, businesses where human capital manages matters less. But I was at a conference with Compass Group, the caterers the other day. It's not true, actually. If you're working uh, in an army canteen or in a school canteen or whatever, and you are pleasant and nice and good with people, it's completely transformative, the experience of a customer, the user. Whereas if you've got, you know, a sour face and look like you wish you weren't there, then it's miserable for everybody. And um, that is at least as relevant if you are serving someone their dinner as it is if you're a private bank, which doesn't really make any difference, right? It's still got the same impact on the end user. Um, and I think that it is only people who are thinking in the way that you're thinking that should ever even go near AI. Because if you're like bums on seats as fast as possible, great. This this I'm, I've got this many applicants. I need to get this many applicants hired. I need to do so as fast as possible and um, as at as low a cost as possible. Then you're not you're not going to be doing all this because actually what you're talking about, Danush, is more expensive and slower. Because what you're saying is at the end of this process, and I'm very happy to spend money on, on it because who I hire really matters, because what really matters is the lowest possible risk and the highest possible upside. And that is the mentality of, you know, most of our clients, otherwise they wouldn't buy our rather expensive solutions, would they? Um, and I think in that context, you can experiment very carefully with this stuff. Um, I think there are some businesses that, that really probably you know, shouldn't go near it because it is not really possible to do this cheaply. It is not really possible or advisable to do this quickly because getting the right data set and cleaning it and checking it is, you know, it's slow and expensive. It just, it just is. Um, it, it, it's part of this that there's too much, you know, focus on, on, on risk. I mean, if you, you know, if you're in a small organization, a bad hire is unbelievably disruptive. Um, uh, you, you know, you, you you can't afford to make mistakes in a small team. You can get away with it a, a little bit more in a in a scale organization. Are, are, are too many organ? You know, are, are we too focused on the risk side of that balance and not enough on the on, on the success side? Because I, I, I'm, you know, one of my concerns, particularly in the sort of board environment, is it, it's just way too cautious in terms of uh, adding different voices and different I think, experiences. I think, I, I mean, I'd be interested to know what, what you think, but I, I think my sense is that it's not wrong to be obsessed about risk, but the problem is without sufficient data, the default, particularly with senior appointments, is that you revert, because you want to avoid risk, you revert to familiar, right? So it's, it's an obvious trick. It's called a uh, it's called a familiarity bias, right? So I'm going to hire this guy because he looks and sounds and has a background a bit like a guy who did this job before and was good. Yeah. And now that's not de-risking, because just just because someone is like in their fifties and white and has a nice suit and a male, it doesn't mean they're they'll be any good, right? But people will say. Well, she's a risk hire. Oh, he's a risk hire, meaning someone who's young, black, brown, female, gay, you know what I mean? That kind of thing, right? But really, they're no more of a risk. I mean, they're a risk if they've got a criminal record and they were sacked from their last job for fraud. That's a risk. I mean, I would say that's a dumb risk, right? But people will send, tend to talk about the unfamiliar as being risky when it isn't per se, right? And they say, well, you know, we've got to be very careful. We've got to be careful. We, you know, we've got to go with the safe option. But what they mean by the safe option is not the person who has preferred better better in an objective assessment process clearly linked to the requirements of the job what they mean is the person who is different so i i think is absolutely fine to obsess over risk and i think actually with that in mind the more data you get the more testing you do so long as the tests are designed and administered by people who are themselves diverse i think you know that's great you can de-risk you can de-risk in that way but you don't de-risk by constantly appointing people who look the same you just Give yourself the false comfort of familiarity. And that false comfort carries all the way through. Because when you sack an old white guy, no one says, yeah, well, we did take a risk on that on that white guy. No one says that. But when you sack a, a, a young brown woman who hasn't been any good, then people will say those things, right? Even though they have the same level of qualifications on the surface. So no, I don't think we, we worry too much about risk. I think we, uh, we miss... 
we, we call risk what we really mean uh, unfamiliarity and we're scared of the unfamiliar yeah i agree with that can i just react on a couple of things that ralph you've said you know one is of course, in, in my day job, I have head HR globally for, for Stanchard, which is a bank. And I mean, as, as you know, a bank like ours, which is a universal bank in 53 markets, there's a whole range of jobs, right? So, you know, I, I, I you know, you've got, I, I also have jobs, which is a bit like a factory, right? Yes, so, yes of course, you do retail it's banking just, and all that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, we also run a factory in Merit. And, you know, as a non exec director, I sit on the board of a very big retailer in UK, where actually uh, it's a very sort of similar challenge. You know, you, you've got to be quite conscious if they are going to be jobs, but you're going to have 25 to 30% attrition, how much money you want to spend for hire. It's a very careful commercial consideration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that does not mean not being thoughtful about what does good look like and how do you uh, get the balance, best talent for the job. And, you know, again, as far as an that director, I went to one of uh, the, the big stores, which is a newly opened store in UK, I ended up speaking quite a bit to the store manager who was talking to me about how she had led the recruitment in her store herself. And to me, that was a really interesting case study around the fact that you got to think about the recruitment process end to end, and then can choose to deploy technology depending on scale, how much money you want to spend. But the, the first point is, and you know, in the store manager talking about this new store, she spoke to me about her recruitment strategy. What was the criteria for the job? You know, what were they looking for? How does she think about building that diverse theme? You know, what bit of it? And it was actually, to be honest, almost a case study on the fact that if you start with this is the technology you want, I'm going to plug, you're almost certainly going to come up with the right, wrong answer, right? What really starts with what does good look like? You know, is it, am I getting different perspectives? What is the combination of internal, external? You know, how, how am I thinking about various biases and recruitment? And then are there bits of the process where we can leverage? Exactly, so, exactly, so, exactly. But how she, this store manager sounds unusually thoughtful. How do you scale that level of integrity, intelligence, commitment, thoughtfulness across, I don't know what you've got, 60, 100, 200, whatever it is, stores across the country, because not all store managers are like that. Yeah, and that to me is the challenge, right? And I keep coming back to, again, in my day job, 14,000 people leaders, the amount of investment we have done as part right. of our resourcing reset on our people managers and our right. people leaders, because the reality right. is, uh, yeah. can you hear me, Mark, or am I blanking out? Sorry, just show That's me fine. the thumbs up. Okay, Loud sorry. Clear. Go on. Okay, good. And the, the, the reality is as part of our resourcing work that we've done over the last few years, because again, yeah, there's a massive war for skills and talent. We've got pockets of high attrition, including the country that I'm doing this call out of. I'm visiting our businesses in India this week. And the, the, there's a huge amount of investment that we have done in our people leaders. And let me tell you, I talk about nudges a lot, right? I, I talk about behavioral nudges. So the investment in our people leaders is not just around unconscious bias training. You know, uh, where it's been mandatory, you, you can't recruit in our firm without having gone through proper unconscious bias training. But then also behavioral nudges throughout the, the, the year. I'll give you a simple example, right? We did a data set looking at data to say the percentage of people leaders or the, the, the people leaders in the firm who had a diverse candidate slate presented to them by the recruitment teams, but chose to not pick up a single diverse candidate to interview. You know, that data is available. You don't need AI to do that. You need basic yeah, recruitment exactly, technology. Exactly, exactly. You know, and you know what I did? I wrote exactly. to, I think there were 42 people leaders, including some very, very senior people. And I sent them a note and I talk about nudges a lot. And this was a nudge. So, you know, you've got the group HR directors and you're saying, dear so-and-so, yeah. my team and I looked at some recruitment data. We noticed that you've had candidate diverse, but you're, now we're not asking all we are, We've got evidence which suggests that if you have candidates that get shortlisted for interview, the worst candidates that get shortlisted for interview, there's an X percent higher probability of it being a diverse hire as opposed to not doing the candidate. And the note was, tell me what is it that we can do to support you? It was a very constructive, why is it that yeah, these candidates yeah. are not? And I think you know, that intervention had a far greater outcome yeah. than deploying great AI, and please, I mean, yeah. uh, Mark's yeah. going to kick you and me because he's going to say, 
we are we are, we are not talking about AI and, and I, I'm a big fan of AI. But you've got to think about again. I started off by saying, what is the problem you're trying to? No, solve? you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And I tell you the responses I had from people were amazing. So the one set was, sorry, your data is wrong, you know, but I did five, you know, they spent 20, you know, they must have had five people in their teams running and telling me why. But a huge set of people said, wrote back to me to say, oh my God, like, yeah. you know, you are yeah. I so didn't right. know, I and didn't realize, yeah. I didn't realize yeah. it. Yeah. And, you know, and again, so again, you know, when I talk about how you're validating the outcome metrics, it needs to be done not just in the context of recruitment. So, you know, we in, right. our, in our DNI councils or our DNI governance forums, we actually look at a lot of data that comes out on outcomes, not just outcome metrics, i.e., how many men, women, uh, ethnically diverse people you've hired, but we also look at data on input metrics. You know, how diverse are candidates thought is? What percentage of diverse candidates have gone through second stage, third stage of recruitment processes? Why is there? And, and actually, to be honest, when you talk about validation of data, it is validation of all kinds of data to be able to have some of these behavioral change conversations and recognize that unconscious biases exist. They exist in all of us. And this requires this culture, changing the culture and the mindset requires continuous work. So that's, again, a sort of example of, yeah. of you know, looking at these behavioral nudges at various stages in the recruitment cycle. I, I, I think that's f fabulous. There's this question here from Tina about, when people just think, oh my God, I've got this 10% target, I've got to bung some black people through or some Asian people through or some women through quick, you know, because I need to hit my target. And then you end up with someone who's not good enough, right? And um, that does happen as well as the inverse. The answer is the principle of proportionality. We've launched this thing called the Race Fairness Commitment. It's at racefairnesscommitment.com. It's completely free. Uh, about 50 organizations, nearly all law firms, nearly all the big law firms have signed up. And um, there are some spreadsheets on there that you can download and use for free. Uh, because very, very similarly to what Tanisha was saying, what I'm interested in is not just your overall number. Like I've got this number of, for example, so this thing is on race. It works obviously with other metrics, but this thing is on race. I have this number of ethnic minorities and this number of black people in my firm. That, I mean, that, that, that's, you know, that is a useful metric, but really you want to know what's the candidate pool. Okay. So what happens between the application and the interview? Okay. What happens between the, the interview and the hire? Okay. What happens after one year in terms of attrition? What happens after two years in terms of attrition? What happens after three years in terms of attrition? What happens? And so on and so forth. And you can measure it at every stage and then bang, you cut by function and you cut by department. So you want to know what's going on in your HR function, what's going on in your finance function. If you're a law firm, you want to know what's going on in M&A, what's going on in financing, what's going on in dispute re resolution. If you're a bank, you want to know what's going on in IBD, what's going on in markets, and so on and so forth, right? And you can even get more granular and go to individual groups, individual desks, individual areas, individual managers. Let me give you an example. If you are in a law firm and you've got a trainee, you've always got a trainee, right? The, the way it works in law firms is trainees do four seats of six months, unless you're at Freshfields, in which case it's eight seats of three months. But anyway, you do four seats of three months and you get a four seats of six months and you get a, a, a grade at the end. And now law firms, elite law firms, do not set out to recruit bad trainees, right? That's that's not their that's not their game. That's not their strategy. They do not set out to uh, put onto training contracts people who have failed law school. So they recruit you out of your undergraduate degree and they put you through law school. So you've got you've usually done a vacation scheme, you've got a degree and you've been through law school and you've done pass, 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 pass. And nearly all of them are scrutinizing your grades and they're giving you these tests. So you've done an external test and you've got your 17 contract law. So you like and then you come in and you're a bad trainee. It seems a bit unlikely. So what we're saying is let's look at individual supervisors. OK. Mr. So-and-so, you've had 14 trainees in the last seven years. Six of them have been ethnic minorities. You have given every single one of the ethnic minorities a poor rating. And uh, the white candidates have got a real mix of ratings. Um, but these candidates haven't had bad ratings in their other seats. Can we talk about that? And then you, oh, I didn't know, I didn't realize. You get the same thing, right? And then you get, oh, I don't see race. To which my response is, well, if you don't see race, you know, to some extent, you don't see me and you don't see him and you don't see her. Because if you go through life as a minority, you don't have the option of not seeing race or of not being seen. Right. And 
It's about checking your own behaviors. You know, there's some fascinating stuff. People have done studies tracking eye contact between different um, employees and their bosses, their managers, right? And there's some crazy stuff, which is that, except it's not crazy at all. There's some stuff which suggests that people who are similar to people will make more eye contact with them and people who are dissimilar, you know, they will, managers will literally look at people who are dissimilar to them less. And there are good neuroscientific reasons for this to do with different parts of the brain, the fusiform face area and the amygdala that will share activity and evoke different feelings under different circumstances. So the fusiform face area evokes feelings of warmth and familiarity, and it's literally triggered when you see someone who looks like you. The amygdala uh, evokes feelings of threat and fear, which is sometimes triggered when you see something that is unfamiliar or someone that is unfamiliar. So it's not the case that you're a bad person for having these instincts. It's a case that they need to be monitored. There needs to be a continuous feedback loop. And if you are not capturing, reporting this data, if you're not scrutinizing it, if you're not running these calculations, you're not going to know. Once you know, and once you bring it to the attention of somebody responsible, someone who manages in a division or a function or a desk or whatever, for them then consciously to, so you're bringing the unconscious and making it conscious. If you then choose consciously to continue with that behavior, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're doing something which is unethical and illegal and unarguably both of those things because it has been brought to your attention. Most people won't do that. Most people are not bad people. Most people, when the facts are presented to them in an unemotional, helpful, collaborative way, will try and change. Yeah, most people, are, I, I agree with that. People want to do the right thing. And the barriers to doing the right thing are, you know, usually things around pressure, unreasonable targets, uh, uh, you know, over, overload, um, and, uh, you know, nudging them down the... the and, 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 some, and sometimes it's, and sometimes, sometimes, it's, sometimes it's just ignorance, right? So we've done a load of um, research. We did a, um, a research piece a couple of years ago called Closing the Ethnicity Stay Gap, because we realised that ethnic minority yeah. lawyers leave private practice much more quickly than white lawyers, and so we interviewed a ton of people and asked why. And, and basically what happens is, these are super high-pressure jobs, and um, very, very well paid, but very, very high pressured. And they're really difficult for everybody. But if you're, for example, one of three black women in your intake and your supervisor calls you consistently by the name of one of the other black women, uh, you, you just think, like, forget it. You know, like, this is so difficult. Uh, yeah. They literally don't even know my name and you're more likely to walk, right? And, and so the training that we've um, produced, which is called Hemisphere, we call it anti-bias training because I'm not always sure that it's all really completely unconscious or subconscious all the time, but it definitely manifests as bias. We give people really concrete tips, like make sure you're getting people's names right. Like, you know, don't touch black people's hair. Like really incredibly specific stuff that only really works in the context of the UK. It's UK training and that only really works uh, in the context of we've done a huge amount of research and we've talked to people who've been on the receiving end of this stuff and we know exactly what the behaviours are. And sometimes when you get this granular with people, they'll get, you know, people who are effectively committing racist acts, they would never see it like that, but that's how it's experienced by the person on the other end. They'll go, oh my God, I had no, I had no idea. I'm really sorry and I will, I will change that. And, it, you know, it does seem, it does seem to work. But it's all got to be done in this non-confrontational, data-driven way. Otherwise, it feels like a witch hunt. So how, how how should a smaller organization I mean get going on this? Because you know, we, we've talked that there's a there's a huge amount that you need to do to be really ready to do this in, in a in a sensible way. There's a huge amount of extra work that you need to do um, uh, to uh, to build that longitudinal data set that you referred to and to do those retrospective studies that Tanish talked about to make sure that you know, you're actually driving the right the, the right things. That's pretty daunting if you're a small organization. Well, um, sure. it's pretty difficult. So how do you avoid that sort of risk of just, again, just going to a vendor who's going to promise you that, you know, they can solve all your problems for you? How should what, people what, what do you? What do you mean by smaller? Uh, um, that does not have the, uh, 
the, 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 the you know the scale and resources of a sophisticated HR function like Tanishes that can. Well, I think I think there's a gap between like there's di- my business is thirty people, right? This just yeah. doesn't work in my business because it's not. I mean, I, I'm not a huge fan of the eighty twenty. Actually, I think you can get a lot if you have a million lines of data, you can be a lot less. Um, you can you can have statistical validity with a lot less of a swing than twenty percent. But if you only have thirty people, eighty percent of thirty people is just it's too small. I think there is definitely a size below which you can't do it. But let's say you have an organization of a thousand people, you, you probably can, and I'm sure that Tanush will be able to explain better than me how, because she's much more sort of relevant relevant experience. You know, I I will say for smaller organizations, Mark, and again I agree with that, it depends on what you define as small. I, I would really encourage people to be circumspect about what is the part of the recruitment process focusing on a which will get the best outcome. And it could very well be that there are loads of pieces of work that needs to be done around interview panels, you know, right level of training and awareness, you know, how do you measure effectiveness of process before rushing to yeah. buy the latest shiny toy? And that is genuinely, I you know, we all love it, right? I mean, you know, Digital HR, you know, we've all attended talks, spoken and talk. Everyone wants to talk about the new shiny toy they've acquired. Uh, my strong view is some of the best. I mean, we've got some great sort of examples around use of technology and Stanchard's 100,000 employees. So it is a really big business and you know, it's across multiple markets. And actually, the use of technology drives uh, without using and leveraging technology appropriately, you could not run the recruitment engine. So, you know, it, 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 a lot of it is a, not a luxury, it's a necessity. But but to me, if I look at the, you know, we call it the great resourcing reset, we've had a big piece of work, which is where we're looking at all aspects of re- resourcing, line manager training, recruitment, recruiter training, et cetera, et cetera. And I think I found that actually some of the pieces of work we've done, we've had the best return of investment have not been necessarily the technology related pieces. That's what I, I, I'm going to say. You know, there's a question on Sue, sorry, I'm changing track a little bit because I don't want to run out of Sue, your question, which I think is such a good one that, you know, Sue says that there is a risk that the HR professional may buy in an AI powered tool service without understanding the risk. And I think Sue, you know, I've been three and a half years in my role. And if I look at the area where I've had the steepest learning curve and I'm still such a novice is in the area of technology in HR, the use of technology, yeah. Yeah. how do we deploy it? What does it mean, et cetera? And I'm still uh, learning. And one of the biggest realization I had early on as I had sort of loads of ideas that have preached to me is that a, a, a lot of us, and I, I include me in that, don't fully understand the rules that underpin the technology solutions that we are buying and don't understand yeah. the how and the why yeah. behind AI derived de- decisions. And uh, uh, and that was a real learning. And, you know, for me then very early on, it was about A, getting some, you know, and I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be able to have a big team and I, to, to buy the real expertise into my team, but then closely partner with our uh, 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 technology team, especially the AI sort of experts, and in both as part of learning myself and my team, but then getting the real ex- expertise. And the, the conclusion I've reached and my absolute one principle is that for AI systems to operate responsibility, explainability and transparency to me are the two criteria. You know, and you know, Ralph, some of the examples that you've given, you know, you're able to explain that so currently, I found as I started meeting a, a, a lot of people, they could not explain to me clearly. And I, I, I consider myself as somebody with above average intellect. And but if you right. cannot explain to me clearly why a decision is being made, uh, you know, using the uh, or how you've reached that decision using that piece of AI or technology, that's not what I am interested in in buying. So explainability and transparency are absolutely uh, uh, a key. And, and, and that's been a real, uh, that's been real learning for me. And, and, and are you getting, are you, getting um, uh, you know, obviously you're, you're an exec team member and a, a non-executive at, at another company. Are boards asking enough questions about this and being challenged enough about this? And are you getting 
questions and challenges, you know, from, from from candidates in relation to 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 this. Is you know, is the is the process accountable enough? Yeah. Um, so as yeah. I will say to you, I do believe the level of awareness around this topic is still nascent, right? And it yeah. varies between individuals and, and lines of work that are nascent. I will say. Um, uh, from a stand chart perspective, we have a responsible AI sort of framework and actually some of the responsible AI work that we did, as well as some of the data governance that we've done around people data, uh, the amount of investment that we've made in that is, I would say, in pockets more than the level of work that's been done on the business side, because it became so clear to me that this use of digital uh, technology and AI was the tsunami was hitting it so hard that, you know, to be able to work with the experts to have that AI governance standards um, and risk mitigation framework and having th those governance processes was absolutely uh, key. So the short answer to your question is the, the understanding is nascent, uh, but it's increasing. I think the boards are investing huge amount to upskill themselves around these topics. So, you know, many of the large yeah. boards, you know, ours, the other board I sit on, you know, have got external advisory experts yeah. that are uh, advising them. And my experience has been the questions coming from candidates are much more in the Western Hemisphere. You know, we are largely an emerging markets bank. We've got businesses in the US, UK, parts of Europe, but that's nowhere in size and scale to our businesses in emerging markets. And I believe some of the questions that we are getting around candidates, uh, are, 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 yeah, the maturity is more in the Western world, at least for us. Uh, that, that, that's been my experience. Yeah, and I think there's a role for the, you know, regulatory intervention here would be helpful. You know, this is one of the areas where, where, where I think you know, if, if, if regulators were driving explainability, driving um, transparency in relation to to this as a as a way of demonstrating fairness uh, and an appropriate use of uh, of data, I think that would be really helpful. Can I uh, take one other quick question and then? Yeah. You know, there is a question from. An anonymous attendee who talks about, you know, as organizations are profit oriented, AI provides a better solution. Why will they keep human? And I think it's a really, really good question. And again, goes beyond this topic. But, uh, you know, for, for, for I, I believe my uh, generation of HR professionals, I think this is going to be a really big sort of dilemma. My, my view is that technology and AI. Uh, replaces activities and tasks, you know, and, you know, we have to think about tasks and activities as opposed to full jobs. And what, what I'm seeing is in our end-to-end -end recruitment process, there are some really interesting opportunities where you can replace activities, tasks by technology. It could be either backed by AI or not backed by AI as opposed to for humans. But how do you repurpose from a capability perspective then the human to focus on the value added skills is yeah. not something we talk about enough. So, you know, yeah. how do you get them to apply appropriate judgment? How do you interpret the data? What are the kind of questions to ask? What are the checks and balances? So underpinning this entire conversation is a huge amount of upskilling and reskilling of recruitment functions, right? And be, be, because, and if you don't focus on that at the same time, you are going to end up losing a lot of humans. But if you are able to, you know, will you need, Less a human, there is an efficiency play here. I, I won't lie, but to be honest, an automation is around activities and tasks as opposed to end-to-end -end jobs. And I think mm -hmm. there is an there's an opportunity to do value add by humans in a very different way. What, what do you think that's going to leave us in terms of you know the role of judgment, the the residual role of humans in the in, in, the human element in the in, in the process? You know, that, the hope is here that we, we go through some you know, final some finally some proper transformation of what is right, really quite an old and tired model in many places of, recru of, of recruitment. Uh, you know, you have a CV, you have a chat for an hour, and then you make your decision. The, the, you know, this ought to be able to take us to something that is, you know, a, a much brighter path to cultural fit, a much brighter path to an assessment of potential, a much broader um, skills-based assessment of an individual. You know, what, what do you think the get this really right what do you think the future will be will be like there and what will be the role of judgment in this process so i mean i, I give my view on the rest and this is my view and i've uh spent quite a bit of time with our recruitment teams we've got hundreds of, sort of recruiters and what do we want them to focus on 
building greater relationship with clients. You know, I actually believe the recruiters are the entry point to talk about the brand and the culture and the strategy more, more broadly. So, you know, what, what happens is the role of the recruiter, if technology is deployed appropriately, becomes much more around how do you build the relationship with the clients? How do you use some of those conversations to tell the strategy, culture, purpose conversation holistically, which itself becomes a part of screening process. I say, if that initial conversation is done well, there could be a few individuals who say, well, this is fascinating, but this is not for me. And that by itself yeah. actually brings a, a, you know, data interpretation, you know, you want to, and the biggest thing that this gives opportunity for the recruiters is to ask some of those probing questions that Ralph spoke about to recruiters. Where is the time today, right? You want them to say, you weeded out these three pro people in the process. You know, let's just go back to the criteria that you've been put in place. Is this the right criteria? Can we challenge them? So, so, so I think it's the the influencing skills of recruiter, their data interpretation skills, their client relationship skills, their ability to be able to translate. I mean, I genuinely say to my HR team, a recruiter is such an important job in the organization because look. You know, I, for every person we hire, we get four to five CVs minimum in emerging markets. You know, last year we had 58,000 CVs, 58,000 people mm -hmm. who expressed an interest to join our organization. Look at the opportunity that ha that we have, not just from um, from an employer branding perspective, from a future talent pool perspective, but from a future customer base perspective. You know, either those individuals will come and work for us. But even if they don't, hopefully all of them will bank with us. And, you know, that is the responsibility or the opportunity that a recruiter has if they are supported with the right level of technology, which helps with efficiency, but also giving good quality. Insight. Data yeah. Insight. It, it, it becomes it becomes less of an administrative job and more of a job around judgment and charm and storytelling. It's a much more attractive job, actually. It's part of the reason that recruiters like this. Because, it, you know, done right, it makes you a more important, it gives you a more relevant, important and interesting job uh, who, and a less boring job. So so you would like this. Look, I think um, there's a question about um, if, you know, if you're being sold, if someone's trying to sell you an AI solution, what are the questions you should ask? You know, how do you know if it's legit, legit or not? Um, you should ask, uh, tell me about the data on which this product was developed? How big was the data set? How long was it? What were the data points that were being measured? You say it's diversity proof. What are the diversity data points that you are capturing? So you say you're capturing ethnic minorities. You break down people from different ethnic minority groups. How big was the sample in total? How big is the sample of each ethnic minority group. You say you're measuring disability, how are you doing that? You say you're measuring sexual orientation, how are you doing that? What about class, were you measuring that? Does this data map across to, in which geography was this data gained? Does it map across to others? For example, you could turn around and say, look, it's as clean as a whistle in the UK, right? Because we've got all of our CRE or, or um, CEHR categories and so on, and we've got yeah. statistical validity. Okay, but now you're going to take it to Malaysia, but the challenge is different there. Yeah. And and I don't believe race is a universal thing. I believe race is a social construct. So you're asking different questions and so on. So you ask all that, and then you say, okay, this algorithm, is it supervised or unsupervised machine learning? Unsupervised machine learning is where the machine literally teaches itself to ask the questions. With unsupervised machine learning, you get male is my single most positive data point. If it's supervised machine learning, potentially better. Okay, so who wrote it? Who are they? Was it one person who checked it? Was it a group of people? Who were they? If you've done all that, you'll start to get a sense of whether this is serious or non-serious. Because if you are a brilliant computer scientist and you build a model that does something with AI and recruitment, you will get funding for it and you will be able to bring it to market. And I know because I meet them because they all, they, you know, it's a small world and you bump into people and you'll ask them these questions. You'll be like, this person can write code, which by the way, I can't do, but they don't know anything about people, about diversity, about the law, you know. So those are those are the questions you should be asking. There are a couple of other questions. Uh, but sorry, sorry, right. I, sorry, go on, go on. But go sorry, on. I mean, on that point, how many of the people that you actually work with ask you those questions? How, how, demanding are your 
you know, you know, a, 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 a your clients and, and, no, no. and Tanish, what do you do to challenge the, the you know the vendors that, that that you've used? Is there more that people you know what what would be your top tips for you know for for partner selection here? So rather, I mean, on, 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 on my part, like ninety five percent of them don't ask any of these questions yeah. and are up for being sold snake oil and. I or my team, look, we've got over 90% annual retention rate. We frequently refuse to pitch to businesses because we think that our solutions don't work. And our whole thing is about lifetime value. It's not about volume of sales. No. We are, you know, so we will put people off. But I'm telling you that there is a thirst for this magic tech bullet, yeah. which does not exist. The more junior and inexperienced the recruiter, the more likely they are to want that. And uh, we tell them the questions they should be asking. Allied to this is a question of information security, right? If this is data about, you know, AI that's going to drive a self-driving car or whatever, it matters less. But in our world, when you're talking about not only people's telephone numbers and their home addresses, but you're also talking about their ethnic origin, whether they have a disability, whether they spent time in care, this is considered uh, in the in the legislation to be sensitive personal data, right? And again, we will explain, look, we've got this certification called ISO 27001, which is a platinum standard information security thing, yada, yada, yada. 95% of the people we pitch to don't even ask. The procurement department, after you get the yes, the procurement yeah. departments sometimes do ask, but we are ahead of our clients in thinking about these things. Uh, and they are not asking the right questions. And because they are not, 5% do. 95% don't, because they don't ask the right questions, they buy some rubbish and then they don't renew after a year. Yeah. And I think it would be much better for the profession if if recruiters and HR people generally did ask tougher questions and didn't buy the rubbish, because the problem with the rubbish is it gives us all a bad name. Well, again, I wonder if this is a role for, you know, if there's a role for the regulator here in terms of helping guide people through this. You know, if you're gonna if you if you're gonna use these services responsibly, these this is the diligence that you should be going through. I mean, I would be supportive of that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, can I, I mean, just add, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I mean, let me tell you the way we've approached it because it's not just in recruitment, you know, we've got an AI-backed talent marketplace, which basically does a, a matching of supply and demand of skills. So it's, you know, an internal, creating an internal gig economy. So we've sort of made some purposeful choices around technology, some of it are back, some not across sort of HR. And um, the couple of things that I will say, one is you got to have the right level of people. And by level, I don't mean seniority. I mean, expertise of people who sit around the table having some of these conversations with, uh, with these vendors and external providers. And, uh, and diversity of that group is very important, right? Again, I'm going to say this again. I, I, if I have four people say, so, so, you know, when, when we've had some of this, I've had junior recruiters who are dealing with this day in and day out, technologists, you know, I've had people from our DNI council, nothing to do with HR, in our DNI, part of the selection panel when we have gone into RFP processes. So I think it's diversity. You have to have diverse perspectives who are going to be approaching uh, the, the data. We, like I said, we have invested quite a bit of time in HR coming up with a responsible AI sort of framework, looking at data privacy, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a lot of standard set of questions that we ask. But the third thing, which I find really exciting about these partnerships, is you get to experience while the vendor introductions, user cases of best examples of how other companies are dealing with it. And you know, for HR professionals, that is fantastic. You know, so for me, it's about understanding the technology, as I said, you know, uh, explainability, transparency, the what, why, list of questions, having a diverse set of people on your side, having these conversations, you know, not just, you know, your CEO, HR organization or whatever, or wherever you decide to do it. Uh, I, I will definitely not leave those questioning to my procurement team. But, you know, they, they do have a very critical role to play, but they... I, I, I don't expect, and that would not be fair to expect them to understand or to play the role around what is the problem we are trying to solve and getting into some of those very specific questions that Rav sort of talks about. But I, I would say in all the choices we've made, we've done done huge amount of due diligence from 
uh, to look at user cases, uh, you know, from my counterparts instead of other companies or other people who've used it and, and how have they actually used the piece of technology to drive business outcomes and what do those business outcomes look like, which obviously helps us in making the final choice, but actually makes a broader uh, contribution to our overall people agenda, you know, so, so that has benefits that go beyond just the choice of technology. And how's that sort of how's that loop back from your retrospective studies informed that? You know, have you got better have you got better user user cases to discuss with your vendor as a result of the of that learning? How's how's that process? How's that learning process? Work? I mean, I mean, Mark, to me, the the beauty of the partnership or any of these partnerships is basically the uh, and not just the technology you buy or the product you buy it's absolutely the opportunity to be having that's what i call that sparring relationship that helps yeah. build the quality of the product but actually helps you get the maximum from the product as well i mean i spend disproportionate amount of time with my team looking at the products that we've bought what percentage of functionality we are using what's the outcome of that what are the gaps in it we actually insist and i'll be honest our vendors and partners welcome it to have um, in, in in some of them uh, uh, an opportunity to be part of the advisory team of the vendors so for you know our talent marketplace that we do or our new learning, learning management system we've been very keen and you know our partners have have loved it to say that look we would like to be part of your advisory council that is helping with future product design right so that the learnings that we are, you know, the data or the learnings are retrospective is actually helping make the product better. And I mean, for the, uh, all of them that we use, you know, I have a very regular catch up with uh, the, the, the CEOs, uh, the owners of the business, where my starting question is, what are we not leveraging? You know, what are people doing with this piece of technology and this product that we are not doing? You know, what, what is the gap? Challenge us. So, you know, you got to have a relationship where you give them the space to challenge you as well, both in terms of, uh, you know, the use of product or the technology, but actually broadly around where you're experiment or not experimenting. So, so I think that having that partnership conversation is key. And is, is there... You know the sort of user network and the community of users that that there needs to be in relation to this. The, you know, obviously, we spend a lot of time at the IBE con, con, convening groups of practitioners to get together and talk about co common challenges. But is that is that happening across? Do you get a sense that that's happening to the right extent uh, across a world where uh, you know things are changing pretty fast? When we built our contextual recruitment system, we did it with a user group, exactly as Tanush describes. Yeah. And we had recruitment partners from Slaughter and May and from Freshfields. We had a head of grant recruitment at Clifford Chance. We had a BCG partner, chief psychologist of civil service, head of recruitment at Oxford, head of recruitment at Cambridge, and so on and so forth. That's seven years old now, that product. It's changed a bit, but not much. And the, the user group continues to meet, and the iterations come from them. I think it's a really powerful thing to do. And I think... It's not always natural for businesses to talk about something that is competitive. And of course, recruitment is competitive. But I think when they do, they can build, they share knowledge and they build industry standards. And it's really net positive for everybody. Uh, it's my experience from the outside. I mean, Tanusha obviously is on the inside and we'll be able to say more. Yeah, because I think the a lot of the danger here is that this becomes the sort of, as soon as this becomes a competitive advantage, uh, it becomes that sort of secret source and people are reluctant to to share their experience. I think, I think there's a lot to be said for the data being um, developed and tested on a large enough data set that yeah. you can have real confidence in it. And then the competitive dynamic comes in how you use that data rather than in the creating of it, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, what... One thing I wanted to get to, because uh, quickly, because it's so easily forgotten. I'm afraid that you know the the sort of um, uh, the Cinderella's quite often of the of, of internal inc inclusion work is you know our, our disabled and neurodiverse colleagues. It, there's a real risk here that we build something that actually um, doesn't help those communities and, and in fact um, creates new and additional barriers here because um, you know there's not the opportunity to apply human judgment at the at, at the right time how are you 
how do you both see that and how and 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 Tanish, what you know practical steps are you doing to make sure that um disabled and neuro uh, neurodiverse candidates get a have the opportunity to participate equally in, and, and are judged fairly i mean this is work in progress for us mark and i'm going to declare that sort of upfront and as we are learning more about it there are a couple of things that we have done already but there are many more that we want to do especially uh, around uh, uh, neurodiversity. So the first thing is uh, accessibility and inclusion um, uh, are criteria right at the selection stage of the tool. So, you know, do you have accessible versions which are, uh, um, you know, accessible versions which uh, are, are suit various categories of, uh, of sort of disability? I think that is a, a core criteria on our, um, uh, selections, especially this is true for machine driven tests, uh, you know, we are very, very conscious that around machine driven tests, that AI uh, does not screen out our candidates, we also use gamification quite in quite a bit of our large scale uh, 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 hiring and what we are now doing is asking colleagues, uh, asking applicants upfront if they suffer from some form of disability and we found that even in our gamification there are accommodations that can be made, even within existing tools, there are accommodations that can be made uh, to, uh, to support uh, some of the needs. Again, for color blindness. So I think the, the, the bigger thing is the amount of disclosure, the amount of questioning you do upfront uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, people declaring the support they need. And we have found actually, even within existing te technology, there's quite a bit of accommodation that we can make. So, you know, color blindness, we have found that there can be changes made to color and patterns um, in, in uh, images. You know, you've got color blind palettes now across majority of our tests, which su support them. So, uh, again, there is so much out there. But for us, it's been around uh, accessibility and inclusivity at the time of vendor selection. So, to be able to get that into the list of list of questions, and then be able to have those open and transparent conversations with candidates uh, early enough so that we can uh, tailor solutions to see suit individual yeah. needs. And I, th I think the other thing about getting the data up front, of course, is it then allows you to monitor impact in exactly the same way you would on any other diversity category. Mm. That's really helpful. Um, I'm conscious of time. Um, you know, may, may, maybe just sort of one final question to, to, to each of you. And I hope, sorry, as we've gone through our questions, I think we've we've kind of got to most of the things on that list um, without necessarily direct, directly answering all the, all the questions, but thank you for your input from, from, from the audience. Um, but you know, perhaps just a, a, few, a few final remarks from each of you about what you would encourage our audience to do now. We, you know, what should people be doing today? How can people take this forward what are the you know what are the the big lessons that you've learned as you've been along this journey and what should people have front front of mind so i don't know who wants to go first on that i'll go first the first and most important thing you must do is get diversity data from applicants and from staff you need ethnic origin data you need disability data you need gender data if it's appropriate in your in your jurisdiction you probably want to collect sexual orientation data and perhaps religion data as well and you always want to crunch the numbers what's happening in every recruitment process what's happening in every selection process what's happening in advancement what's happening in terminations what's happening in progression what's happening in pay you want to cut that data by all of these categories and you want to look for discrepancies you want to look for disproportionalities and then you want to go to the people who are responsible for those disproportionalities and you want to tell them what's going on and you want to ask them why that's step one step two um i think it does not hurt to reiterate certain principles in terms of leadership what is and isn't acceptable what you are and aren't trying to drive for and step three and really only when you've done step one and two is look for automation that will make your processes swifter or easier that might or might not include ai thank you Tanish. i'll just build on uh, what's been said I, I think there's a real opportunity for all the practitioners on this call to upskill yourself on you know, you, you know i'm not advocating that we all become deep technologists or or, or can write codes ourselves but but, but I think it's really incumbent on us as 
as people, uh, the rest of the organization is looking for advice on these issues to upskill ourselves. And, uh, um, and you know, so that, that for me is, is the first area. And I think then spending a huge uh, amount of time on being very, very clear on the, the problem statement. You know, what is the problem that you are trying to solve yeah. across the end-to-end -end recruitment cycle? And then getting to solutioning as opposed to, you know, I know it's been said a couple of times, getting taken up by the newer shiny toys. And there's some great new shiny toys. Yeah. And then trying to plug, you know, your process around it. So, you know, upskill yourself, understand their positives, negatives. You know, we can't stay away from uh, you know the, 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 what's happening in the world of, of digital HR, you know, either enabled or not enabled by AI. So understand it, but then spend a huge amount of time. What's the problem we're trying to solve? An end-to-end -end process that will help us try to solve that problem, and then take decisions around around the technology. So I, I think that would be add-on. Was what Russell has already said. That's really helpful, and, and uh, you know, I hope everyone today has enjoyed the discussion. I hope. Um, it's given plenty of food for uh, for thought for our audience today. Um, you know, I think we've seen the you know the challenges and the opportunities of getting from uh, you know somewhat Tanish talked about about properly understanding the problem that you have uh, today um, to some things we talked about with, with Ruff earlier on about breaking that cycle of familiarity that we you know that we know is is. You know, so damaging in terms of creating the right um, diversity of, 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 of thought and experience in in the workplace. Um, an incredibly helpful conversation. I'm enormously grateful to um, uh, both of our panelists for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much for 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 your time, and thank thank you particularly Tanish for for joining us from 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 India today. Um, I, I hope your day is not. We haven't just added another hour and a half onto what will already be a long day but thank you both um and uh there will you know as i said there will be a recording of of, of this available but we're, we're very grateful for, for for your time today um just thank quickly, you <laughs> pleasure so so just quickly before we close um you know we are going into our summer break our next uh, IB event is on Thursday the 8th of September um, at midday we're, we're going to be joined by Simon Fanshaw who is the, the author of The Power of Difference he's a broadcaster consultant and author and was a co-founder of, of Stonewall amongst his achievements over over the years he is going to be talking about some of the um, complexities of, of diversity and inclusion and uh, some of the practical solutions, uh, how it's the differences amongst us that really matter and how um, we can, you know, how cultures can bring that together in a way that, that generates uh, uh, in innovation. Um, hopefully that, what he's going to talk about chimes a bit with um, a bit of thought leadership that, that we put out at the IBE uh, a little while ago. So we'll pop that into, yeah, Alex has popped that into the, 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 the chat um, where we, um, we issued a, a, a board briefing on, uh, on, on DNI uh, and diversity in, in boards and how um, boards need to get beyond um, gender and color and need to get beyond uh, notions of targets and um, really uh, accept the genuinely embracing, valuing and blending a wide range of life experiences uh, and, a, and a wider range of thinking is, is key to, to having effective boards. So I hope you'll join us for that. I think that will be, I think that will be a great discussion. Um, and if, if it's half as good as the one today, it'll be terrific. So thanks again to our panelists. Um, uh, have a good summer. Thank you.